Good day everyone, Dr. Polaris here. Do you like dinosaurs? Interested in paleontology? <laughs> well, that's a given since you clicked on this video. But have you ever wondered, as I have, what actually makes a dinosaur a dinosaur? Given their depictions in recent pop culture, you'd think that there were four simple descriptors here. Big, scaly, extinct, and totally awesome. In the popular consciousness, any animal featured in the Jurassic Park or World films immediately qualifies as a dinosaur, regardless of appearance and lifestyle. For example, news articles concerning Jurassic World often referred to the oversized mosasaur, which didn't just jump the shark but also ate it as well, as being a sea dinosaur. Similarly, t the pterosaurs are seen attacking guests at the park are often said to be dinosaurs as well. In the movies and media outside of scientific circles, anything prehistoric and vaguely reptilian seems to qualify as a dinosaur, with the public being left none the wiser. Most people that I've spoken to about this subject tend to share these ideas, which is understandable as they have their own lives to lead and, and the question of, is it really a dinosaur, is not at the top of their minds. As well-known science campaigner Aaron Ra once said, don't know any more about the fossil records and what they've seen in a few plastic pieces in a prehistoric playset. Not only do they typically think that all these things are dinosaurs, they might even think that these are all the fossil forms that are known. They have no idea how rich the fossil record is. Just to make this easy for you, I'm going to remove all the actual dinosaurs from this image, all except one. In the top right hand corner there is a yellow terror bird. Now that actually is a dinosaur, just like all birds are, and I'll explain that momentarily. But the two pliosaurs beneath it are not dinosaurs. The three specimens closest to the tree at the bottom are mammal-like reptiles from a time before the dinosaurs. A lot of people aren't even aware that there was a time before the dinosaurs. At top center there is a pair of pterosaurs and everything else here is a mammal. Now some creationists like Carl Gallops think that even mammals are dinosaurs but that just shows that he doesn't know what a dinosaur is. Not everything that is big and dead is a dinosaur. It also doesn't help that scientific literature can seem very arcane and impenetrable to those not in the know. With its many lengthy Latin names and, and various anatomical references, it is easy to get lost, with clear and concise information lacking on the internet. I hope that in this video, therefore, I could help redress this balance, and I hope you find this helpful and informative. But back to our main question. Just what is a dinosaur anyway? To answer that, we need to go way, way back to the late Permian period, roughly 252 million years ago. All the Earth's continents were joined together into one supercontinent called Pangaea. Your place of birth. Pangaea. The interior of this continent was dry and arid, and seemingly barren and hostile to our eyes. However, terrestrial life on Permian Pangaea was abundant and diverse nonetheless. Dinosaurs did not rule this ancient world, partly because of the fact they hadn't evolved yet. In their place, bizarre therapsids dominated, animals once referred to as mammal-like reptiles, but now considered to be proto-mammals, more closely related to you and I than to any lizard, crocodile or dinosaur. They inhabited all sorts of environmental roles, from large saber-toothed predators to goofy-looking, thick-skulled herbivores. Animals that would traditionally be considered reptiles, now known as, by the name sauropsids, were very much secondary players in this world. Two major groups of sauropsid reptiles that were relatively recent arrivals were the lepidosaurs and the archosaurs. Sorry to throw so many names at you, but, but I promise that this won't, there won't be too many more of these. Lepidosaurs are the group that includes the familiar modern lizards and snakes, as well as the Tuatara of New Zealand. Lepidosaurs are united by certain anatomical features, including a sprawling limb posture, well-developed sternum, and teeth that are fused to the interior side of the jawbone. They are all cold-blooded due to retaining a low-energy stance. In the late Permian, these animals seem to have been quite rare, with the fossil record of lepidosaurs from this time being very slight indeed. However, due to phylogenetic bracketing, we know that they must have existed, given that their archosaurian cousins were around at this time. The retention of such a 
poorly developed fossil record is probably due to the fact that most of these lepidosaurs were small in size and their delicate bones were easier to damage and decay, leading, le leading to less of a presence in the fossil record. Their cousins, the archosaurs, however, have left more complete remains from this time. Whereas the lepidosaurs were generally small and lizard-like, archosaurs were larger animals, usually over two metres long. Examples of late Permian archosaurs include the long-bodied Proterosaurus and Enigmastrophius, both of which were terrestrial predators of small prey. Joining them were the Proterosuchids, crocodile-like animals with a strange notch in their upper jaw. It was from animals like these that the, more, that the later crocodilians, dinosaurs and pterosaurs were descended. Archosaurs, especially the more advanced ones, are differentiated from lepidosaurs by their more upright posture, teeth solidly fitted into grooves in the jawbone, and a reduction or loss of the sternum. These features enabled these smallish predators to be more effective and energy efficient than their cousins, with higher metabolisms. These traits would serve them well when an earth-shattering extinction event would wipe out most of the once-dominant therapsid proto-mammals, setting the stage for a massive diversification event that would eventually lead to the dinosaurs themselves. The ensuing Permian mass extinction struck 252 million years ago. Caused by a combination of extreme volcanism, runaway warming greenhouse gas emissions, and several asteroid impacts, this was an event of such biblical proportions that it is hard for us to fathom today. Terrestrial life on Earth came perilously close to disappearing altogether, with 75% of species vanishing from the fossil record. Rates in the oceans were even worse, pushing upwards of 90%. The reign of the proto-mammals came to an abrupt end, with only the pig-like dicynodonts and the increasingly mammal-like cynodonts surviving the extinction event by a wide margin. With the death of their main competitors, the archosaur suddenly exploded in diversity, producing a myriad of bizarre and novel forms in the ensuing Triassic period. From proterosuchid like ancestors arose lineages that led to the crocodilians and their relatives, the flying pterosaurs, and of course the dinosaurs, as well as many other groups that are less familiar to us. As interesting as these groups are, we will now focus on those animals that were considered part of the dinosaur-like branch of the archosaur family tree, the dinosauromorphs. While their crocodile line cousins were dominating the large animal niches, the dinosauromorphs were generally small and slender. They all shared an advanced ankle joint that functioned as a single hinge, allowing a greater degree of mobility. This trait, combined with shrinking forelimbs, led to these nimble animals adopting increasingly bipedal postures with limbs tucked directly underneath the body in a manner similar to mammals. It was these anatomical features that would later pave the way for the extraordinary evolutionary success of the dinosaurs. But what really distinguishes dinosaurs from their close relatives, particularly the pterosaurs and the crocs? For a start, as mentioned earlier, the hind limbs of ancestral dinosaurs were erect and held beneath the body. The head of the femur in the hind limbs fitted into an open groove in the pelvis that facilitated upright bipedalism. Their erect posture enabled early dinosaurs to breathe more easily while moving, which likely permitted stamina and activity levels that surpassed those of sprawling reptiles. Erect limbs probably also helped support the evolution of large size by reducing bending stresses on limbs. Some non-dinosaurian archosaurs, including the Roysuchians, also had erect limbs, but they achieved this in a completely different way, with a so-called pillar erect configuration of the hip joint, where instead of having a projection from the femur insert into a socket, the upper pelvic bone was rotated to form an overhanging shelf. Nowhere was the dividing line between dinosaurs and non-dinosaurs more tenuous than during the Middle Triassic period when various populations of archosaurs had just started to branch off into dinosaurs, pterosaurs and crocodiles. Imagine an ecosystem filled with slender two-legged dinosaurs, equally slender two-legged crocodilians, or crocodilian relatives, and other plain vanilla archosaurs that looked for all the world like their more evolved cousins. For this reason, even paleontologists have a hard time definitively classifying Triassic reptiles like Marasuchus and Procompsognathus. 
At this fine level of evolutionary detail, it's virtually impossible to pick out the first true dinosaur. The 240 million year old Neasosaurus parringtonite might qualify for this role. This small animal from Tanzania may well have been close to the ancestry of all dinosaurs, but its status is uncertain as the animal is known from very partial fossil remains. Aside from the presence of erect limbs, however, the anatomical quirks utilised by paleontologists to define an animal as a dinosaur become rather arcane if you are not familiar with animal morphology. Try on the phrases elongate dectopeltorial crest on the humerus and concave articular surface on the fibula of the calcanum for size. In 2011, Sterling Nesbitt of the American Museum of Natural History attempted to tie together all of these subtle quirks that make dinosaurs dinosaurs. Among these, he noted, were a radius, a lower arm bone, at least 80% smaller than the humerus, the upper arm bone, an asymmetrical fourth trochanter on the femur, the leg bone, and a large concave surface separating the proximal anticular surfaces of the ischium, aka the pelvis. You can see why big, scary and extinct is more appealing to the general public. Outside of hard anatomy, one very important trait present in dinosaurs were feathers. In addition, you can quite easily differentiate dinosaurs from other prehistoric reptiles, often considered to be dinosaurs proper, by looking at the lifestyles of the respective animals. For example, dinosaurs never adapted to a fully marine existence, so if you see a large aquatic reptile of any kind, it's certainly not a dinosaur. While some dinosaurs adapted to a semi-aquatic mode of existence, for example the, the uh, crocodile-like spinosaurs, they never adapted to a fully marine environment and left this domain to other reptiles. Avian dinosaurs fly by utilising modified forelimbs lined with specialised feathers functioning as an aerofoil. Pterosaurs, those flying animals that are often confused with dinosaurs, on the other hand, had wings formed by rigid sheets of skin attached to an el incredibly elongated fourth digit on their forelimbs. These taut, sail-like structures were further attached to the body and lacked any kind of flight feathers, although the bodies of pterosaurs were covered in a fuzzy coat of hair-like fibres. Also, another animal often stated to be a dinosaur by certain video games and articles written by journalists is the sail-backed Dimetrodon. In truth, Dimetrodon was an ancestor of the late Permian proto-mammals discussed earlier, and is therefore more closely related to humans than it is to dinosaurs. So, to keep it simple, dinosaurs were archosaurian reptiles defined by their erect hind limbs, having a radius shorter than the humerus, and by a ball and socket hip joint connected to the pelvis. Size also did not play a factor in making a dinosaur a dinosaur. Although many dinosaurs were massive animals, a large number were also rather modest in size, being human-sized or smaller. The smallest non-avian dinosaurs were the size of pigeons, while the largest were equivalent to some baleen whales in length and mass. So remember, big, fierce, scaly and extinct does not a dinosaur make. Thank you so much for listening. I know that this, this is a new channel, but I hope to produce more interesting content like this every week, so remember to subscribe, like and comment if you want to see more paleo stuff like this. I also have a DeviantArt page devoted to speculative evolution if you feel like having a browse. Once again, thanks for listening, and I hope to see you again soon. Cheerio!